Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, thank uh, Histoire Canada, Canada's history, and also Michel uh, Duquet. I know he was sitting here. I can't see, but uh, for inviting me to be part of this great event and to sit next to uh, great colleagues. And what you've heard uh, is only like a, a small glimpse of the great work uh, these uh, historians of women have been doing uh, in their you know, respective careers. So actually, this is what I'd like to talk to you about. <clears throat> and some of my questions, uh, I think, will link nicely with what we heard in the previous uh, panel. And the first question is always the basic one, but it's important that we start asking this now as we're starting to compile the stories of historians of women. Uh, in Canada, we started to do this in the United States and other countries. So the question is, how did you develop an interest in re researching the lives of women? Was this accidental? Uh, was there an event in your life? Uh, was it the university you were at? I'd like to hear uh, from each of you on this. And I'll start with... I'll start. I'll start. Um, I did not start writing about the lives of women, and I still don't consider myself a historian of women's life. I consider myself a historian of the Pacific Northwest, of British Columbia, and more generally of Canada. And if you're going to do that, you have to include women. As I explained in my talk, women sort of come as traces. But before that, um, I was a, I did a graduate degree at Harvard in Russian and, Af and Sub-Saharan African foreign relations and worked and worked in London for a year analyzing, uh, every day analyzing the Soviet press for their coverage of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I found out only after the end of the year that it was a front for the Foreign Office, which I didn't know when they hired me. However, <laughs> the point of the story is, is we all have many lives. In some ways women have more, sometimes have more lives than men do. What happened is my husband got a job at the University of British Columbia. And I quickly discovered that in Vancouver, in British Columbia, there was not a great deal of interest in having an expert on um, Soviet Sub-Saharan African relations. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, I became increasingly interested in British Columbia, which still continues to fascinate me as a place which is part of Canada, but on the other hand, is also its own place. And it's beyond, it's beyond the uh, mountains in many, many ways. And <clears throat> eventually went back to UBC, got a doctorate, was fortunate enough to get a job at UBC, and so I was able to, and had a husband to support me, uh, and was able to teach and write as I would. And I think that we have to have, if we think about in our own lives, whoever we are in the audience, however we are here, that we have, we have certain things which matter to us, and we have to figure out in some ways what those things that matter to us, because it's those things that we write about what matters to us, that's what keeps us going, and I think, takes all of these fine projects that we start and brings them to conclusion. And they're, you know, I think everyone in this room is here because they've got, they've got something that inspires them and hopefully that something that inspires them has a strong um, component in it that's about women's lives as well as about men's lives as well as about all our lives. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, I think there's two things. One, I was in high school during the social movements, the women's movements that was taking place and was one of those people who had a jacket filled with buttons and went to marches and sort of was a little bit too young to know what it was really about, but clearly had an impact on me in terms of my life. Uh, the other thing is, uh, like Jean, I started as a music person. I actually taught music in school for many, many years. And uh, so when I came to a history department, I was, uh, really surprised at how male it was. The narratives were na male, the teachers were male, they told a lot of male jokes, and I was looking for the voices of women. So I think that's what, between those two things together, you know, was the impetus for me to look more closely at women's voices and experiences. Okay. Um, uh, does it work? Oui. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I will try to answer in English, so excuse me for the, uh, the mistakes. Well, it's a long, long history. Uh, I was in, uh, during my BA, and uh, there was no woman, no, uh, nowhere. And I was told that uh, women uh, didn't do, uh, there was no Michelangelo, uh, female, or female uh, 
um, Leonardo Vinci, where are they, the genius of the past? A uh, woman has done nothing. So I said, okay. Uh, and then I was in my, my, my years at, at Miguel, actually, and um, Madame de Chêne, Louise de Chêne, who was one of the first uh, female historian uh, to work uh, very uh, seriously about history, doing a very serious and male job, actually. Um, she was teaching us at that time, and uh, but it's a professor uh, of French history who um, taught us to think by ourselves. Actually, he asked us to have an opinion of on what we were writing in our uh, papers, and uh, of course we had to um, to uh, how do you say prove it and uh, explain our point and the argument. And this man, at one point, arrived in class and said, who knows who is um, Marie de l'Incarnation? And I, like everybody, <laughs> <laughs> not really. Then who's? <clears throat> Comment ça, vous savez pas? How, do, uh, how can you, uh, you live in Quebec? You don't know who the defenders of Canada and blah, blah, blah. And then I said, whoop, but I... And I went to him and said, okay, I want to do an MA on, <clears throat> on her. And I was surprised because at that time, this woman, uh, in her writing, she talked a lot about uh, demon, demon, the demon, the devil. Mm -hmm. And so I want to travel to work on the devil chez Marie de l'Incarnation. And I was looked uh, upon like a fool because uh, at that time we were counting les cordes de bois, the, log, the wood logs. We were doing a very serious economic history, and uh, I looked like a fool. So I decided to, to go along because I was unconscious. This is for the kids over there. <laughs> Just go on. And then I did my MA, and my my the how do you say the uh, my focus on the devil bring me to alterity, to the otherness of the Indian. A good Indian was possessed by the devil, a good, uh, uh, no, a good Indian was possessed by the divine, and a bad Indian was possessed by the devil. And this, I realized that Marie de l'Incarnation was saying, it's, important, it's impossible to convert these Indian because they are savage. Uh, we, uh, we, we are able to convert them to religion. They can be a good Christian people, but we cannot on peut pas les transformer. We cannot transform them into French. So, and so at that time when I tried to, uh, tr because I wrote my paper, my MA thesis in French, I tried to uh, uh, translate uh, the uh, uh, the word other, uh, alterity, and there was no word in English for otherness. Um, so we had to figure out something. And now today, alterity and identity, it's uh, uh, common uh, knowledge. And then I decided to quit women and go for serious history. So I did my, my whole work of PhD uh, and uh, postdoc on male missionary. And then while I was doing that, the femmes ont surgi de cette histoire-là. There is no Catholic reformers in France that try like Vincent de Paul, I don't know if it rings a bell for you, but all these people, all these men, they had a woman either in front of them or beside them. It's incredible. They are everywhere. They are giving the money without la Duchesse de Guyon, there is no Canada, period, period. This niece of uh, Richelieu has given her fortune to found the colony. Without her, no, there is nobody here but the Indian. With, so c'est une autre histoire. On est en grâce à Dieu. So that's it. Uh, so I return slowly but surely to women, but then to women and men. You know. So this is it. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a historian of la condition féminine. I'm a historian of gender. I'm a historian of politics, and uh, politics, and I'm looking at power. 
who has the power in the prescription mm -hmm. and then in practice. So you see the power of la mère, the mother. Look at it, it's very important. She is uh, having the, the, she has the money, les, les cordons de la bourse, as we say in French. Uh, so you look at money, you look at power, you look at religion, of course, you look at sex, because as soon as a woman comes close to power, she's accused to be sexually deviant, because normally she should be f feeble and weak. So that's it. And now I'm teaching a course, which is a gender history of uh, France, um, French, uh, France and Colony, which is called Sex and Politics. <laughs> and half of it pertain to men, actually, mm -hmm. because it's a gen really, I'm, I'm gendering the history, and it's so fun. You should see uh, Henri III of France in the 16th century, he was called a homosexual because he was too feeble, you know, uh, in the war of religion. But he's not, not at all. And so this is where the, the posterity stick to, to him. Um, Henri IV, he's the DSK of, uh, you heard about, it. No, maybe not the young, but the DSK of the 17th century, he almost uh, provoked uh, uh, a, a war with the uh, Netherlands uh, because he wanted to pick up a mistress over there. So that's uh, incredible. And nobody talked about it, but the 16th century in, uh, in England was the, 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 the uh, woman ruling. And in France, you have Les Régences from 16th century, uh, Catherine de Médicis, the 17th century, Marie de Médicis, uh, Anne d'Autriche, who was not La Potiche, the, that everybody talk of, of thought mm -hmm. she was, not at all. She, uh, she, all these women worked, and they were political, polit politically involved. And that's why. So I'm sorry. No, <laughs> you're passionate about yeah. what you do, and that's very don't important. Me, don't get me started. So. <laughs> so, so Ruby, can we turn it around and ask how you got interested in women? Excuse yeah, me. You. Can we turn it around and ask how you got interested in learning oh. about women? Well, when I I started my PhD at University of Montreal. Um, my supervisor, uh, some of you may remember him, uh, was Michel Brunet, uh, nationaliste fervent. And uh, why did I choose Michel Brunet? Because I have read his uh, various works, and uh, he was interested in education, and I wanted to do a thesis on the history of education in Quebec. But you could not do anything on women at that time because there was no courses. It was cinq que ça. <laughs> so I, I take an appoint, I make an appointment to see him, and he was quite surprised. And the first thing he tells me when I sit him down in his office, he says, oh, "Vous savez, vous êtes la première femme que j'ai au niveau du doctorat. Je sais pas comment faire ça." <laughs> so uh, that was my first encounter with him. But I, but that being said, uh, I had a wonderful experience with Michel Brunet. Uh, he was a dear man, and uh, I think he gave me wonderful training, uh, which I've used uh, ever since in women's history and in educational history. But, you know, you couldn't, and many of us of that generation could not do a thesis, a PhD thesis in women's history, because the field simply did not exist or was just starting to. So that that's my, my, my story. And uh, actually, um, it took a while before there was a course in women's history at University of Montréal. It took quite a while, you know, so that I, I have to, uh, to say. Okay, so thank you for asking me. <laughs> so but my, my second question goes to, we have three minutes left? Yes? Oh, and I had so many interesting ones. Uh, I have to ask this one because there are young people in the audience <clears throat> and uh, my, my daughter is pursuing uh, computer science but she's interested in history. So my question has to do with historical scholarship in the digital age that we've entered. And uh, I'd like to have your view, uh, each of you, your view on this. Um, the challenges but also the promises of new technologies of the digital world as far as, you know, uh, writing the history of women. And I'll start with Rose because 
you've been involved in this. You gave us good examples of what you've been doing. So I, I'd like to hear you on this, and then I'll ask uh, the two other colleagues. I think it's wonderful that it's easier to access uh, women's uh, lived experiences by just going online. I think that's great because before if you had to find books or materials in your schools, you maybe didn't have it. So I think that's a plus. But what I find with my own students and what I've always found with students is of course they want to find it quickly. <laughs> Everything is about speed. So they just Google it, right? They just Google, and uh, whatever comes up, the first few things, they got it. And so that's problematic. So finding a, that's why I'm arguing for looking, getting away, or even using uh, the computer to access local stories, real people and communities, um, and look, going to the local archives or museums or historic houses, will find things that you won't find online. So I think it's good as a first step, maybe, but you have to get away from it to find those specific voices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jean. I think uh, one thing I was reminded of from Rose's presentation, and I was trying to do the same in mind, is to look at images, to get images, mm -hmm. and then people look at images, because the images of women are, in most cases, much more interesting and much more conducive to learning. Men all wore the same kind of stuff. You know, if you look at them, they don't tell you as much. When you look at the images of women, uh, they'll tell you, they can tell you a great deal. And I think for students, they tell a great deal. In terms of books I've written, when I've had um, sponsors, one of the advantages of email is that you know, anybody who reads what we write, they want to complain, they come back to us, or they want to follow up, they come back to us on email. And what I've discovered in kinds of emails I've gotten back from students, both undergraduates and some high school students when you, when you do history fairs and doing, um, and also graduate students, is where can I get the pictures? Where can I get the images? Where can I get their voices? And so I think that there are possibilities which are not, um, would not be so accessible before. So any of you who are interested in doing, uh, you know, interested in writing the history of women, know about the history of women, you know, make other people aware and you will have, um, you know, you'll have your email box filled with people asking those kinds of questions. And so in some ways it's still the word of mouth, the word of mouth, the word of email, the internet makes I think a lot more of this possible than it did before. Not so much directly going from the same kinds of beginning points we did before, but thinking of all those intermediate ways that we can do it in the in the sort of almost like in the everyday. I just wanted to add that I didn't recognize and that's uh a poor decision on my part, uh, that there are wonderful websites out there, right? And certainly organizations like Venier that uh, have put out so much, or Great Unsolved Mysteries, or The Virtual Historian, and all of these places where you will find women's narratives online. It's just, uh, you won't necessarily find it from Googling, right? For me, and I will be short. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, as an European historian and American historian, I work in very old archives and mm -hmm. sources, and for me, internet is a trésor, because uh, there is a lot of sites that has um, uh, numerized, you say? Com numerize, uh, reproduce, uh, yeah. uh, digitalize. Mm -hmm. So this is a mine, uh, really it's fantastic, and especially in the classroom, because I can just send uh, extract very easily to my student, uh, really, uh, so it's perfect. But the problem is, is that in this uh, information, who is doing the inventory, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Putting, uh, this is the big, this is a challenge. Yeah. But for me, it's, uh, I use it constantly. I'm mm -hmm. always, uh, my, mm -hmm. my computers are filled, <laughs> are filled up with uh, the, these documents. Can I add one, one thing very quickly? I was reminded by seeing Laura Campbell's name here, mm -hmm. that what she's done in Vancouver, which has been incredibly popular over the last four or five years, is she's organized something called the Herstory Cafe. And so every month there's a presentation by somebody, which and, and through the internet it's all open, but it'll be, for instance, one case it was a woman who runs a restaurant with her husband talking about what did it mean to be a woman, a woman in terms of running restaurants. It's not necessarily historical, or it's people who are working on uh, topics in women's history that can attract an audience which goes across across Vancouver, everyone from academics to uh, teachers to students. 
And so I think there are some ways that we can all play a role actively as well in our communities to popularize uh, the stories of women, the lives of women, uh, historically and also in the present day. And certainly for anyone who's interested, you can see Laura Campbell's email for reading, for reading about her in the program and figure out how they've done it in Vancouver. Tremendous success. I'll just conclude on a point that I have a lot of students, uh, and I think rightly so, who are really concerned about sources and now I know the, I've learned the jargon a little bit, the digital born archives, emails, you know, I mean, I've used letters, you know, for my research, I still do, but they're afraid what's gonna happen when they wanna do research on, let's say, women engineer, that's my, my field, and 10 years from now, but even today, because they're only, of course, uh, using email, uh, very little printed, material anymore. So, so uh, again, that's a challenge for the digital age and doing the history of women in any other uh, group for that matter. So I think we have, and preservation is important. A lot of us have mentioned this. I think it's a key, uh, key step and we have to be very vigilant, of course. Okay, so I think our time is up. We could have continued on, but we have a reception and uh, please go and talk to uh, Jean, Rose, and Dominique, and uh, with a glass of wine, and thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.